All right, so we have a lot of folks starting to join us now. So I just want to welcome everyone who's joining us this afternoon for our, our presentation um, on apples and pears for the Backyard Fruit webinar series. We have a, a guest speaker today that we're all excited about, and uh, we're looking forward to introduce him here shortly, but we do want to allow um, time for everyone to join us. I will go ahead and, and just share a little more context about the program for anyone who's new and tuning in for the first time. Again, this is part five of an eight part series. Um, it's a multi state collaboration between the University of Georgia, um, LSU University, Auburn University, NC State, and the University of Tennessee Extension. Um, we're all really looking forward to sharing this content with you. I um, personally, I love apples and pears, so I'm, I'm looking forward to this presentation. I will go ahead now that we have about 200, I'm going to introduce our speaker. So today we have Dr. Mike Parker. He's an associate professor and the tree fruit extension specialist in the Department of Horticultural Science at North uh, Carolina State University in Raleigh. He has an extension research and teaching appointment and his extension responsibility is to support North Carolina cooperative extension field faculty and growers in the culture and management of tree fruit, primarily apple, accomplished through on-farm research and demonstration, educational program development, publications, and on-site consultations. Dr. Parker's research focus is on the development of tree fruit practices and systems that are sustainable and profitable for North Carolina and southeastern growers. Dr. Parker's research on apples is concentrated in the area of successful replant strategies and rootstock evaluation. And he's also involved in student education and responsible for a graduate and undergraduate class titled Physiology and has quite an experience in engaging the public and teaching. Uh, additionally, Dr. Parker was raised on a small family owned farm and operated in Michigan and will try to incorporate practical application with research based information into his presentation for raising apples and pears in small settings. So um, welcome Dr. Parker. We're so happy to have you with us today. I believe um, participants are still slowly coming in, but we don't want to delay too long with your presentation. So. I'm going to uh, turn it over to you if you have anything else to add, and we look forward to your presentation. Okay. Well, thank you, Ashley, and good afternoon, everyone. It is a privilege to be with you. Uh, again, I would much rather be face-to-face. -face. However, with our current situation, I think we've been able to have people from a much wider range. Uh, so it is. It's good to talk to you all. Uh, as we go through and talk about, I believe the chat uh, function is, is working. Uh, to Ashley. So again, if you have questions as we go through, I would sure welcome those. Uh, but again, as, as we start talking about tree fruit, let me make sure I can go through here. I guess uh, and we're, we're going to be talking about apples today for the most part. And I think the key is not growing apples and pears, but it's going to be successfully growing apples and pears. So I, I think that's going to be the key that hopefully that we can go through, we can talk about successfully. Uh, as Ashley has said, I am a faculty member at North Carolina State University. I work with tree fruit. If it grows on a tree and you eat it, I get the opportunity to work with it. Uh, so again, a couple things here. If we look at the bottom here, you can look at my web page. Uh, many of the things we'll be talking about today, I have publications and videos that are uh, available. If you go to that, go to uh, Mike Parker. Uh, when you look at the web page, it pulls up. It's got my picture there. You try, have to ignore that. But on the right-hand side, it says comprehensive resources. If you click on that comprehensive resources, we can go there and see uh, all the publications. And at the end, we've probably got another 30 videos that will talk about tree fruit production. So again, you're, you're giving your valuable time today to listen to me, but who am I? I guess that's kind of thing as we go through and talk about. Uh, people have always said that those who can do, those who uh, can't teach. Um, and I hopefully you can put that to rest. You got an idea where I came from. Uh, you can probably tell from my accent, I'm not from here. I was raised in Michigan. My parents had a small fruit farm. We had about 40 acres of, of fruit, probably 35 acres of apples. So uh, basically 
cherries, peaches. It was also through roadside retail. Uh, this is our retail operation. We operated probably eight months out of the year. Down the, the right-hand corner, my parents, uh, basically uh, we made cider. So it was uh, a retail operation. So hopefully as we go through and talk about today, um, I will impart some of uh, my experiences. But any, you know, experiences are good. However, unless those experiences are backed up with sound uh, research-based information, uh, you have to be somewhat skeptical. Here I was teaching Sir Rack and Cloth Cider Press behind me here, talking to a group who did quite a bit of uh, entertainment farming, festivals, and that type of thing. Realized I was raised in a town of 2,000 of people. We would have festivals where we'd bring in eight to 10,000 people on a weekend. So again, hopefully we can, I can impart some of the passion as I go through and talk about, hopefully you'll hear some of the passion that I have, because it's uh, basically who I am, but it's what I do. At the university, again, I get the opportunity to work across the state. Uh, the upper left-hand corner, this is some of the research plannings that we have uh, in our research station just south of Asheville. On the right-hand side, you can see looking at peaches, most of our peach information is developed uh, from the mountains, but primarily from the Sand Hills region, uh, going to be southwest of Raleigh. And then the bottom uh, two pictures, we do a lot of work with pecans uh, or pecans, depending where you're from. Uh, so again, that's what I do, the type of work that I do. But again, I, I want to make sure that you understand that I'm talking today about backyard production. But I'm going to make a differentiation here. You know, this, these are pictures that were taken from my house. I just had the opportunity to move when our house was condemned for a highway that went through. But I had a semi-dwarf apple tree in the upper left. The upper right, it's a pear tree. It's a dual liter, two liter pear tree. It's not ideal. However, when I moved into the house 25 years ago, it was either leave it there or cut it down. So you, you deal with what you've got. And then the bottom half, uh, left-hand corner, we or the bottom, again, you can look at, those are uh, uh, pecan trees, younger as well as older. So again, this is what I do a lot of times, I work with commercial production. These are 100 acre operations, 100 acre plus, whether it be up or left. Uh, we have peaches grown as a perpendicular V, uh, with somewhere around 500 trees per acre. Or down the bottom here, it's one of our apple growers in the mountains. I don't make a differentiation many times when I'm talking about one tree or 100 acres, it really doesn't matter to me as far as uh, the size of the operation. Because when you plant a fruit tree, you have to realize that the goal of that fruit tree is, is to develop you know, fruit. So again, even though the scale may be different, the recommendations many times will not be. So again, I realize we're talking about backyard production today, but I'll use some of the experiences that we have from our research plantings uh, to hopefully make some of those um, recommendations and suggestions. However, I must give a disclaimer to start with. Uh, I will try to talk you out of growing apples and pears before I talk you into uh, trying to grow them. Uh, growing apples and pears, many times there's an allure to that, that, oh, we want to grow apples, we want those beautiful red apples, those beautiful gold delicious apples. Or we want to grow those nice pears, the Bosque or Bartlett or D'Angelo pears, that will miserably fail here. So again, these are primary tree fruit that I use in North Carolina we talk about. We talk about apples, peaches, nectarines, and pecans. And I believe Dr. Dave Lockwood will be talking to you later this week about peaches and nectarines. Dave is a very knowledgeable source of information. He's probably forgot more about fruit than I'll ever know. But today I would like to talk about pears and apples. And again, however, the disclaimer I have here, many of the fruit crops that we have are going to require a high level of management. If you're not ready for that, if you're not ready to have that input or uh, ready for that work, you might want to consider something else. You see here I, my primary tree fruit, I have apples with a high level of management. I also have pears requiring a very high level of management. And primarily that's going to be for insect and disease control. There's nothing worse than putting a tree out there, giving it a slow, painful death before you get fruit, and then having the trees die. So again, if you're not ready for that input, I would encourage you to try something different. In North Carolina, I always say, if you might wanna try growing figs. If you can't grow figs, you might wanna consider woodworking. Because again, the, the level of management that's required is going to be significant. So again, when I talk about tree fruit, I always talk about what do you consider up front? Many times, late winter, early spring, people walk by stores, maybe a grocery store that has a pallet sitting out front with fruit trees on it. 
And people look at that and they've got that beautiful tag there. It may be cold, it may be snowy, it may be icy. They see that picture of that beautiful uh, pear, that beautiful apple, and they buy the tree and take it home. However, when you walk by something like that and buy it, they're called impulse sales. Impulse sales usually are going to be destined for failure with tree fruit. So again, considerations I would like you to consider before you buy your fruit trees, even before you, you know, consider what you're going to put out there, look at the soil, look at the site selection. How about cultivars or varieties? What are you going to be using? You don't plant what you can buy. You plant what you want, what will survive. We can look at pollination requirements. We can talk about root stocks. Uh, for some of you from the south, when I say root, I mean root. Um, Work with our growers coming from Michigan, they somewhat make fun of the way I talk about that. So again, we talk about rootstock selection because with apples and pears, they're all going to be grafted and we'll talk about that in a minute. And then we can also look at insect and disease control. And really that's sort of a misnomer when it comes to insects and disease, who controls whom? And it's really gonna be insect and disease management that we need to be looking at. And I must say up front, I am a horticulturist. I am not an entomologist or plant pathologist. So I will give you some of my considerations from a horticultural standpoint. We talk about soil requirements. What is the soil pH? How acidic is the soil? It really doesn't matter how much you want to fertilize your trees with if you have not adjusted your soil pH to 6.0 to 6.5. We get below that, many times the nutrients will not be as readily available. We talk about correct fertility as well as pH. How do we understand that? In North Carolina, we have our soil tested. Our Department of Agriculture provides that service that we can send soil samples off. They'll come back and tell us what the pH is, how much lime we need to apply to adjust our pH, and then also what we need to do as far as fertility. Usually phosphorus and potassium uh, will need to be added. And again, this is before planting. If we look at pH, trying to adjust pH once that tree is planted, is gonna be somewhat less than ideal. You put lime on the soil surface in North Carolina, it's going to move maybe an inch a year and we plant that tree 10 to 12 inches deep, it's going to take many years before we can modify the root zone. We also need a well-drained topsoil. We want 16 to 22 inches. If we don't have that, maybe a raised bed or a berm in a landscape setting. And then, it's not as uh, applicable today, but Dr. Lockwood will talk about it. It's also essential to test for nematodes before planting peaches and figs. And again, when we take that soil sample for fertility, we would also send that off to look at nematode populations, especially in our lighter and sandier soils. So again, uh, soil requirements, these are, these, uh, we look at site selection, these are not uh, uh, specific only to tree fruit, but they do have uh, quite a bit of applicability. We talk about your fruit tree, plant it in full sunlight. If you'll look at a tag and it says, requires at least six to eight hours of sunlight a day, I used to get in trouble when I told a half truth. And even though the tree will grow in limited light, it will not be productive or as uh, sustainable as, as required. So again, we talk about full sunlight. We know that the flower buds for next year are going to be forming within the next three to four weeks. That's a biochemical process that's driven by light. If we can get 35% of light on a leaf, there's a good chance we'll have a flower initiated for the next year. So again, what we say, Parker, you know, basically 35 is a long way from 100. That is correct. However, once we move 18 inches inside that tree's canopy, light levels can drop by at least half. So if you plant it in 50% full sunlight, 18 inches inside that canopy, you'll be below that threshold. That's why we look at older trees. Where is all the fruit? The fruit's going to be on the outer edges, the top and the outer edges. So again, we want our trees planted in full sunlight. We also want to reduce our insect and disease pressure. You know, and one of the best ways to minimize that is actually have good light penetration to promote quicker drying. And then the final thing we'll talk about that is for optimal fruit quality. When you're having a peach or an apple, a high quality fruit, we're looking at sugars, which are developed by sunlight. That's not a, you know, that's, that's not rocket science. I think we teach that in most of our third grade classes now. But again, for optimal fruit quality for sugars, we're going to need at least 75% full sunlight. On the other hand, many people are going to like a tart fruit. But what makes a, you know, a tart apple tart? You know, what gives uh, basically the stamens or those apples that, that crisp and that 
that lock jaw, if you will. And that goes back, it's from the acidity. It's not a lack of sugar. It's going to be from the acidity. Realizing that a lemon will have about the same amount of sugar as a red delicious would. But the difference is, is going to be in acidity. And both the, the sugars and the acids will be formed through that photosynthetic pathway. So again, full sunlight for optimal fruit quality. Then we talked about frost and freeze probability, low-lying areas. Uh, many of our, our growers actually two weeks ago, we had a scare. We had temperatures that went down. And some of our lower areas dropped below some of our thresholds, 25, 26 degrees, which kills a blossom. But as we move up in elevation, 10 foot in elevation can give us about a degree in, in protection during those frost and freeze during the spring. And the last one we talk about site selection and spacing, the spacing is going to be dependent on the fruit type and a rootstock. Planting a full size apple tree next to your driveway or next to a house is not going to be an ideal place to be putting a fruit tree. So again, understanding where that's going to be planted and realizing it's not the size of the tree when you plant it. You may plant a three foot tree. However, if you're planting a full size pear tree as a young whip, what is that tree going to look like 10 years from now? And you need to sort of envision what kind of space that tree will need. So we can talk about pollination. These, this is an apple blossom here. And we can look at the bottom right hand corner. We've got the bees there. Bees are going to be essential for our fruit crops. And again, I, I put this there because I need to make sure that we understand that we do not do anything. We don't do anything that's going to basically cause our bees, uh, cause bee kill, or basically cause them to be endangered because of what we spray out there. On campus here, we have some design students. And design students, they look at things somewhat, maybe a little differently, but they put a sign on their door, it shows a bee, it says, if we go, we're taking you with us. And it's so true that our, our food crops are dependent upon pollination. And we talk about fruit trees, apples and pears, are going to require cross-pollination. Again, cross-pollination, we need two varieties of apples, two varieties of pears. They don't cross from apples to pears. Now again, you say, hey, Parker, no, no, that's not true. There are, uh, there are some uh, varieties that are self-fruitful, you know, self uh, and they are. And again, that goes back to the point of when I, as a kid, when I told a half-truth, I always had issues. So again, and that's the same thing with apples and pears for optimal production as far as fruit size, as far as fruit shape, and as far as return bloom, cross-pollination is going to be essential. So again, I, I must put that up front, and you need to take that into to account when you're planting your trees. Now, uh, any questions yet came up, Ashley, that we need to address? We're, giving, we're going rapid fire here, so I, I will continue to talk. Ashley? Sure, we, we do have one that we could address. You know, um, one individual uh, stated that she has some older trees, about 20 years old, and they bloom, they develop small apples, and the apples uh, drop when they get about a quarter size. Um, and there's issues, of course, with the birds and animals getting them. Any, any suggestions on what could be going on there? I know that could be a loaded question, but... <laughs> <laughs> and my crystal ball is broken this week, so I will have to apologize in advance for that. But the question is, when apples fall about the size of a quarter, what I would encourage you to do is pick up the apples that fall and look at them. There's a couple of things we can cut them across the equator looking, are there seeds in the center? There's going to be those five locules. Um, are there seeds there? Or is it, is it brown? Frost and freeze many times will kill the inside of the fruit and it drops. However, when, once they get the size of a quarter, I would speculate it's probably gonna be insect related. So I would look at the outside of the fruit, and if I was guessing, and depending what we're talking about, if you saw a little crescent-shaped scar, maybe about a 16th of an inch, it's a good chance that plum curculio is going to be involved with that. It's an insect that stings the fruit very early on, and that stress causes the fruit to fall off. So that would be the first thing I would look at, look at the exterior of the fruit, and then cut open the fruit looking at the seeds would be where I would start to, to determine what's going on. Wonderful, thank you for that great answer. And just as a reminder for those who tuned in after we got started, please uh, put your questions in the Q&A section and we will address those throughout and after the presentation. Thank you. As I said earlier, all apple and pear trees are grafted or budded. We call the top portion of cyan and the bottom portion of rootstock. I was doing a program 
in the western part of the state in February, and I was working with a, an individual, and she says, Mike, she says, I've got all these new seedlings. I've got 300 apple seedlings coming up. I've got 100 that I, I pirated, uh, pirated up last year. They're growing in my greenhouse. I says, well, where did you get them? Well, I, I took the seeds from an apple. And, and again, I had the opportunity to tell her that that's probably not the best use of her time or greenhouse space. I told her she may be better off playing the educational lottery in North Carolina for success. The problem is when you plant seeds because of cross-pollination, those seeds coming out of that fruit are gonna be genetically different from each other and they're gonna be genetically different from the parent. And the chances that that fruit growing through a juvenile phase, probably 12 to 18 years when it has fruit, the fruit quality will be somewhat less than ideal. So again, we come in and we graft or bud our trees. What we do is we clone fruit trees because we want a specific apple variety. So the only way to get that is with cloning. And then there's also things with the rootstock that we're looking at, characteristics that we're looking at. But again, because of that, it's important to understand whether your trees are budded or grafted because of how you will plant them. The trees on the left-hand side, these are budded. Uh, a budded trees, it's where we take a bud from one, one, one bud from a desired variety and we graft it onto a rootstock. You can see this dog leg crook there. That's where the, the, the new bud grew out. On the right hand side, this is a grafted tree. You can look down at the, the lower portion, the lower red air, uh, arrow. You can see a V shaped scar. And that is where the variety was grafted onto it. It's what we call a pin. It was about three or four buds. And this happens to be a pecan tree. But again, realizing on this tree, the graft union is really going to be here. From here down, that's all going to be genetically of the rootstock. From the top up is from this point. It's important to understand that when you plant your trees, because I'll show you in a few minutes here. If you don't understand that, it could result in disastrous results for you. Now, budding and grafting, this is another, I guess, trait or characteristics. And it goes about pollination. Uh, you've met, probably seen many trees that basically have different varieties. They call them, sometimes I'll call them fruit bowl trees or rainbow trees, where they put many different varieties of fruit on one tree. This, again, I'm not going to be talking about stores, but this one here is a big box store. I was looking at this several years ago, and they had this pear tree on the right-hand side. Four in one pair, Pyrus communis. And they had an angel pear, they had a suckle pear, they had a Flemish beauty, and they had a Bartlett pear. This was sold in the Raleigh area. And this is one of those trees, it, it will result in return sales because the four varieties they used here will probably die within the first three years in North Carolina because of fire blight. However, as an individual, you can come in, if you have one tree, uh, apple tree or pear tree, you'd like to put a different variety, you can graft onto it. The research station I worked at in Michigan, I think we had nine different varieties of apples on a tree. There's also in the video section of my webpage, uh, Lucy Bradley and I did a, a piece for Almanac Gardener where we went into her front yard and we put two or three different varieties onto an apple tree. So again, this is something you can do to wow your friends and your neighbors. You can make up all kinds of stories about mutations and that type of thing, but it's really just using horticultural skills. Uh, basically, it's, it's, it's a very unique thing to do. If you're limited in space, instead of just having one variety where pollination can be an issue, you can put multiple varieties on a tree have different fruit that ripen over the season, as well as provide for cross-pollination. We graft apples and pears also, primarily apples though, because of a wide range of growth characteristics. And we'll talk about this more in depth, but it's, you know, traditionally apple rootstocks, we had a wide range of rootstocks. We had M9s, you don't worry about memorizing the numbers because the numbers were just how they came out of, how they were named. Again, the, the number is a name, it has nothing to do with size of the tree. But we have trees that would be M9 size category from maybe 30% of a full size tree up to an MM11, it can be 80, 85% of a full size tree. So it's important to understand when we talked about space selection, making sure that the tree you're going to be planting will stay in the allotted space. That's going to be a key in a home setting. When we buy trees, this is the kind of thing we need to look at. There should be a tag on that tree. The top left or the top corner, uh, again, Pink Lady, that's registered and we'll talk a minute. Pink Lady is not a variety. Pink Lady is a registered trademark. The variety is Crips Pink actually. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And then the rootstock is M9337. 
So again, when I plant a tree, I want to know what that variety is. I want to know what that rootstock is. Down at the bottom here, it's crimson gold and a bud nine. M9 is, as we talked about, 30% of full-size tree. Bud nine will be a little less than that when it's properly planted. So again, but notice we have varieties and rootstock on the same tag. Again, I, I took some pictures uh, at this big box store and I was there at the same time I took the picture of that multi-fruit tree. And again, it says dwarf apple, yellow delicious, and then it says apple, red delicious. So how far apart do you plant these trees when you take them home? Don't know. Again, if you look at something like that, I would say don't walk away from those trees. You run away from those trees because you have no idea what you're planting. You may be planting an apple tree on a rootstock that is really not going to survive in your environment. We look at an MM106, which is a good commercial stock for larger trees. However, if it's planted in poorly drained soils into a subdivision where topsoil has been removed and not replaced, those trees will probably die within four to five years from crown rot. So again, you need to be knowing uh, what you're planting before you put it in the ground. I again, I'll stay right here. I would much rather plant a, a tree that I order through mail order, basically as a bare root tree than a potted tree. Again, potted trees can be grown when growth is occurring. Bare root trees should only be planted during the dormant season. And they say, well, I have to order that tree from an off-site location. That's true, well, it won't be adapted to my environment. Well, maybe that's not true. Because remember we talked about apples and pears, they're cloned. The root stocks are gonna be the same whether they're grown in basically North Carolina, Georgia, Michigan, Washington State. Same way with the sign, it's going to be the same. So again, I would much rather plant a well-maintained, a high quality bare root tree that I know the variety and root stock than planted a potted tree that may be somewhat less than suspect if I don't have all the information. So again, these are pictures, you can look at the size. This is traditional trees, we, on the upper left, it's an MM106, it's a large tree. M7 is about a 50% of a full-size tree. M26, probably 40%, and Mark or M9, it's gonna be about a 35% of a full-size tree. These trees were all taken at the same time. They're five-year-old trees. But again, there are major differences in growth. And these are some of the dwarf trees that we're looking at now, Bud9, G11, G935. Just to give you an idea, there are wide ranges in rootstock, uh, growth habits and, and size. Again, and I'll talk about this in a minute, but I'm not sure I see any need to be planting full-size apple trees, unless I'm planting them in an area where we've got deer coming in and browsing the bottom four to five foot. I would much rather be planting a smaller tree where the work can be done from the ground. And again, I'm not going to be talking about specific rootstocks because when you go to a nursery, you may not be able to get them. This is some work being done at Geneva, Cornell Geneva, uh, looking at apple rootstocks. Across the top, you have a list of the traditional rootstocks that we had. And these are all good rootstocks for the most part. Across the bottom, these are new Geneva stocks. And a Geneva stock will be notated by a G period followed by a number. But again, if I'm looking at what I would recommend for most people, I'd be looking about an M9 size tree. We'd be looking at M9. We'd be looking at something like G11, G41, or G935. Would be the, the first four that I'd be looking for. I like the G935 and G41 because they have some replant tolerances. They may have more fire blight tolerance than some of the other ones that we have available. So again, I just wanna make that available, understanding that there are differences in rootstocks. And when you start buying rootstocks for a home setting, you will be somewhat limited in rootstocks you have available. So finding a nursery that can provide what you want will be a challenge. And again, on my website, I also have several nurseries listed and they're not, they're not a recommendations, but they are sources that you may want to consider. This is a, in the top, top picture. That was a traditional orchard taken in the Brushy Mountains of North Carolina. However, if you look at the bottom right, that was at a research station where we're having to prune trees. Again, you notice that there's only five people on the ground, one guy in the tree. Uh, I think the five are there for moral support or to catch him. But again, this is very difficult work. It is very hard labor. It is very difficult to get people that will do that nowadays. However, getting people that will prune the top of trees, that will pick with pick sacks. Uh, again, state employees many times will do things that other people won't. But in a lot of our research, this is not what we want to be doing. This is not really what our growers want to be faced with. One of the major limitations going to be in our uh, fruit industry is going to be labor. 
However, you say, well, I've only got one in my backyard. And that's true. The question is, do you want to be climbing a ladder or using poles to go to the top of that tree? That's why I suggest looking, when we're looking at trees now, I would be definitely be looking at dwarf trees. These trees can grow up and somewhat be, on, you know, we call this high density orchard, if you will. And again, our, our growers have responded with these uh, orchards. This is what they do. They need to get rid of them. So again, we have moved into semi-dwarf trees or we moved into dwarfing trees. This is what we would call a pedestrian orchard. It's high density. If you look at literature, high density, it's not so much the foliage, but it's high density of rootstock. This orchard here is planting somewhere around 900 trees per acre. So you say, well, Parker, I'm only interested in growing one or two trees. And I say, that's true. If you want to plant one or two full-size apple trees, we figure a full-size apple tree will take up about 1,600 square foot, apple and or pear. So it's 1,600 square foot, 40 by 40. In that same footprint of one tree, I could come in and plant probably six to seven dwarf trees. I get more different varieties. I get cross-pollination. If, if I have one tree that's got issues, I can cut it out, and I still have fruit production. So I get, and the, all the work can be done from the ground or a short step ladder. So again, this is uh, one of our commercial growers that's planting it. I need to point out a couple characteristics if you're going to be planting uh, high-density fruit trees. Each tree will have a support system. Here they use a conduit and a wire. Wire is not going to be feasible for most orchards or homeowners. So what we would do is we would take a piece of one inch conduit uh, from your big box store, one inch conduit, drive two foot of the ground so it's eight foot, and then come in and tie that tree to it. They also need to have moisture. This is uh, trickle irrigation on a top wire irrigating the ground. This is one of our orchards in Henderson County. You can see that they're planting the trees at a very high density. This is another one, uh, Wayne Pace, and these are varieties he's got but realizing that the input that goes into these trees is gonna be phenomenal. One of the reasons they do that is because they can do the work from a platform or you could do the work from, from a, a small stool uh, or, or short step ladder. So this is what I would recommend for a home setting. This is a piece of inch and a half angle iron driven in beside each tree and the tree is tied to that stake. You'll also notice that the graft union here, the graft union is going to be four to six inches out of the ground. And we'll talk about that in a minute as well. So again, this, I showed you this picture again, graft union rootstock. That graft union is always, always needs to be above the soil line, whether it be for apple or pear trees. If not, what we find out is that graft, the cyan material above there will send out roots. So if you plant a dwarf tree and you plant the trees six foot apart, you bury that graft union, you will have a full size tree. So you get the opportunity to either take out the tree or take out uh, material around it, or if it's next to your home, you have no choice but to take that tree out. So it's important to understand where that graft union is at for both apple and pear. Dig in a proper oh, Yes, go ahead. Um, we have some interest in learning a little bit more about dwarf uh, root stocks, particularly, can you speak to precocity? When can we start seeing fruit on a dwarf tree? And uh, how long would we need to support dwarf varieties, forever? Good questions. Um, well, I'll t the next two and a half hours, we'll be talking about high density systems, if that's all right with y'all. Uh, this is an area that I get a passion. So the reason we plant those trees is we can do the work from the ground, but also precocity. If we would, again, coming from Michigan, my, uh, my parents, we planted a Northern Spy and MM106. After the ninth year, we came in with knives around the tree to encourage them to set flowers. So again, they are not precocious. With our new varieties, they are very precocious, which means they will set flowers very early on. If we plant a high density tree on one of the dwarfing rootstocks, there's a, we should have fruit within the second year. I don't really recommend fruit until the third year because when you put fruit, we would reduce vegetative growth. I'd much rather take the growth in that second year and put it into having a larger tree for the third year. That's very difficult for a homeowner. Oh, I've got these trees. I want to put fruit on them right away. Realizing when you're putting fruit, it's a very intensive process that will take away from growth of the tree. Uh, as far as uh, the support system, the support system is there for the life of the tree. 
we, uh, what we're doing is we're sacrificing root growth to get uh, fruit and tree growth so that we need to have that system there to hold that tree up because the size of the crop will cause that tree to tip over if we don't have it supported. And then finally, a question we didn't address, how long will these trees live? Commercially, we're not really all that concerned about how, they'll, how long they'll live because many times the variety will become obsolete before the trees die. So again, uh, usually we're looking at 25 years with these uh, orchards. Uh, Again, many times it won't be because the trees die. It just, be, uh, it just gets to the point where they're somewhat less productive than they could or should be. And that's where if we plant uh, two, two full-size apple trees, if we come in and plant five or 10 dwarf trees, we can have trees of different ages, some just coming into production, some in the peak of production, some going out, and then we can cut trees out and still have production in our home setting. Does that cover most of that, Ashley? I believe so, thank you. Okay, so planting these trees properly, we need to make sure that uh, we don't uh, basically glaze our trees in. When many times we use a shovel in the back of that shovel on the left-hand side here, we cause a glazed surface. Uh, that's not what we want. We want that hole to be usually twice the size of the root system and to spread the root system out. This glazing, just hit it with the tip of a shovel, twist it and break it and drop it into the bottom of the hole. So again, it's important to understand the holes that we dig. You don't dig a 50 cent hole for a $25 tree. Make sure you don't sacrifice uh, the tree growth with a small hole. Do not use post hole diggers to dig trees. Um, I've seen that done before uh, and that's, that's not good. Uh, so again, also when you plant that tree, do not put anything in that tree hole except the dirt that you took out. If you have issues that need to be modified, modify the entire environment first, then dig your hole and plant your tree. This is another issue that we have many times when people plant uh, potted trees, we end up with this type of root girdling going on. Roots are sort of like me, they don't like chains. Once they start growing in a circle, they will continue to grow in a circle. The bottom left here, you can see this offending root, it's girdling the trap. On the right hand, you see where we've cut that out. So again, if you're planting a potted tree, make sure that you tease those roots out and possibly cut through those roots with a linoleum knife. Every, realizing every place you're making a cut, that root will send out four or five new uh, root tips. Talk about apple varieties, many different apple varieties. Um, if, usually if we were in person, I would ask what some of your favorite varieties are, and it runs the spectrum. We can look at things like ginger gold. It's a early season gold delicious, uh, developed in Virginia, found in Virginia. We look at, like, at gala, red delicious, empire. Empire is a cross between a Macintosh and a red delicious. In North Carolina, Macintosh do not do well because of our heat. Empire is an apple that we could grow. They give us some of those characteristics. I won't go through all these. Uh, Fuji, there are Fujis that are, are very sweet apples. Uh, there's early season ones, late season ones. Gold Rush is about the only disease resistant cultivar that I feel comfortable planting in the Southeast. So it's a large apple. It's a late season apple, very acidic. Uh, an apple I find to be very, very uh, pleasing. Pink Lady, as we talked about, is not a variety, but it is out there. Then we can look at disease-resistant cultivars, Prima, Priscilla, Liberty. <clears throat> yeah, they're disease-resistant, but why would you grow them? Uh, the quality that we get from those apple cultivars really isn't something I would like to be, to be working with. Then we have antique or heirloom varieties uh, that can be grown. Uh, just because they've been around for centuries doesn't mean that they're going to be insect and disease resistant. But it also doesn't mean that they shouldn't be grown. Just understanding what you're after. And there are others that we could be talking about. We could be talking about something like a, a Granny Smith. Uh, Granny Smith is a green apple when it's picked commercially. However, it's because the green, uh, Granny Smiths are green and they're tart because they're picked immature. But that's what the markets have developed. So again, look at these varieties. There's a wide range of them. Uh, but I would encourage you to talk to your cooperative extension agents uh, to see what may be well adapted to your area. We can look at something like Rome. Rome is a variety. It's, it's a rough and, tough Rome, uh, rough, and, rough and tough variety. It may not have the highest quality of, of eating experience, but it does crop consistently. It does crop heavily. Um, so again, these are things I look at. One of the major issues I would be looking at would be fire blight resistance. Uh, 
if that's going to be an issue in your environment. So again, I'm not saying that these are ones that should be planted, but these are ones that we uh, plant in North Carolina and have been somewhat successful with. Uh, this is a, one, a slide I throw together. This is sort of a, a catch 22 because a uh, gale is a variety I'd be looking at, especially in the Southeast. It's an early season variety. It will ripen before many of our insect and disease uh, or our disease complex is set up. So we may miss some of the rots. Pink Lady, the bottom right hand, it's a nice apple, beautiful apple. However, it's very, very, did I say very sensitive to fire blight? That would not be something I would be planting unless I was uh, ready for uh, fairly extensive fire blight management practices. And then we look at Honey Crisp. Honey Crisp came out of Minnesota, a breeding program in Minnesota. In Minnesota, they call Honey Crisp a problem child under the best of circumstances. So again, Honey Crisp is not one that I'd recommend people plant just because it has many issues that are really hard to deal with. What I would encourage people to do is grow apples that they can grow well and maybe buy the other ones from their local grower or maybe from the grocery store. Hate to say that, but I guess you need to maximize your, your I guess, your, your efforts in my opinion. Sun Crisp out of New Jersey. It is a uh, non-browding variety, it's a good apple. Cameo, bottom left, is a chance seeding found in Washington. Uh, some people say it's a traditional red delicious that should not leave a negative connotation, but it's a high quality eating apple. And then gold rush, as we looked at here, uh, gold rush is a good apple as we talked about disease resistant. And I also need to, at this point in time, if we're trying to grow apples in the Southeast, I would encourage you to consider apples that are gonna be yellow. Realizing red color is developed by sunny days and cool nights. If we're trying to mature apples in August and September, we have no problems in the south, Southeast with bright sunny days. However, cool nights we have, and so our red color development will be somewhat less than ideal in many, in many areas. And then I'll just, uh, this one here I'll finish up with, with apples. Uh, these are club varieties. Uh, club varieties, you have to be a member of the club. I almost put a sign in here, do not try this at home. Or more importantly, you can't try this at home because these varieties, you'll notice there's a trademark beside them uh, or registered. It's not the variety, the variety is something else. A plant patent only lasts for 20 years. Registered trademarks, they last indefinitely. So again, you cannot buy these varieties, you cannot buy these trees. But just understand that when you see them in the grocery store, don't say, hey, I like that apple, I'm gonna have to see if I can't get that tree. Can't do that. Uh, down at the, uh, near the bottom, Washington 38 is a variety. Um, more, it's commonly known as Cosmic Crisp. Uh, cosmic crisp. This is something Washington State has put a huge, huge amount of effort into growing this variety. And you'll start to see that ramping up within the next four to five years. <coughs> Excuse me. It's almost like they're, they're mortgaging the Washington State apple variety uh, industry on this variety. I expect to see uh, 25 million boxes within five years coming out of Washington State. So again, just understand that there are club varieties. When you see the R or TM beside it, those are varieties that you probably won't be able to buy those trees. Move on to pears, if we talk about this. Pears, um, basically, there's many different uh, types of pears. Uh, these are would be a European pear type. The ones that you buy in the grocery store, the Bosque, Bartlett, D'Angelo, don't even worry about planting those because if you do, you'll kill them uh, because of fire blight. They are very sensitive to fire blight. Fire blight is a bacterial pathogen, moves in early in the season. If you see your shoots dying from the tip back without the leaves falling off, you'll have the opportunity to experience fire blight. And fire blight can take out a tree within a matter of a year. So again, I would recommend varieties that have some resistance to fire blight. Historically in the, in the, the east we've, or southeast, we've talked about suckle. Uh, suckle in my research plantings has not been good as far as fire blight tolerance. Moon Glow, Hero Delight, Kiefer, Magnus have been other ones. I'm really excited about the bottom here, Blake's Pride, Potomac, Shenandoah. These are uh, coming out of a breeding program at Beltsville, Maryland, USDA. I've got these in research plantings and they look very good as far as fruit quality goes, as far as uh, fruit size, as far as Potomac and Shenandoah. So again, I would encourage you to plant some varieties that have resistance. Now they're not immune. They're not immune to fire blight, but we're looking at resistance that hopefully is tolerable that we can live with. We look at Asian pears. Asian pears are a true pyrus, a true pear. Uh, again, they don't have resistance to fire blight. 
So again, it will be a challenge. Two varieties required for cross-pollination. Olympic is one that I would probably plant. Olympic Korean Giants, another name that it's sold under. And they can look at uh, Hosui, Kosui, or Shin Lee, possibly, as a pollinizer. But again, fire blight will probably be a challenge with these as well. We can look at rich stocks. Uh, again, we really don't have a wide range of dwarfing with pears as we do with apples. But again, many times you'll buy them on domestic seedlings. Or if you're buying them from a, a larger nursery, it'll be Old Home by Farmingdale. Uh, basically, they're, it'll be shown by OH by F, Old Home by Farmingdale. And again, followed by a number. That number will indicate uh, what selection it is. 333 would be one you could look at. It's going to be semi-dwarfing. So it'll be full, uh, smaller than a full-size tree. What I'd like to encourage people is consider maybe grafting your own trees on Pyrus caliana. Well, you say, Parker, where would I get a Pyrus caliana tree? Well, how about Bradford pear? That's what this is, a Bradford pear. You could come in and graft a, a basically a, a true a fruiting variety on top. Uh, it tolerates, it's a large tree, but it will tolerate wet soils and probably will do better for fire blight. And then some catalogs will try to sell you quince. Quince is a dwarfing rootstock for pears, but there are many varieties that are not going to be compatible. The trees will die after three to five years, and quince is not going to be fire blight tolerance as many of the other ones are. So again, pear rootstocks are a key. Uh, many times if we're looking at it, it would be domestic seedlings. Uh, Betchafolia is another variety that they're sometimes grown on, but they are going to be full-size trees. But again, understanding what the tree is grown on is going to be crucial. And then the last thing we'll talk about this is weed control is going to be essential. You want to grow fruit trees, you want to grow weeds. Again, because a tree cannot compete with the weeds, we can use chemical control we call herbicides. Again, we don't spray the tree. We spray the trunk that may get hit with the spray, but we don't spray the, the tree. Uh, again, herbicides don't know if it's friend or foe. So again, chemical control be used. What we recommend is painting the bottom 18 inches white with a white latex paint when the trees are planted. That way, if anything hits the trunk, it will not cause problem. Mechanical cultivation works, uh, but again, realizing you're tearing up roots and then mulching. The problem with mulching is because tree, uh, fruit trees, apples and pears be very sensitive to vole. V starts with a V. It's not, a vole is not a Tennessee football team. It is a rodent that lives underground or on top of the ground. And maintaining those critters uh, within acceptable limits can only be done with natural predators. Snake, dogs, uh, basically hawks, uh, cats do a good job as well. So again, mulch can be used, but many people say that they, um, they want to do that to get away from herbicides. If you're going to use mulch, pull the mulch back away from the tree 18 inches in the fall of the year allowing a natural predators to possibly work on those critters. In the bottom right hand corner, never, never, did I say never, use string trimmers around the base of trees. That's a good way to kill a tree and I don't respond well when I see trees that have been string trimmed like that. It is not good uh, for the trees. And I will conclude here, we start talking about insects and disease management, realizing this is a horticulturist talking about insects and disease. Take it for what it's worth. But again, it's going to be essential to control pest problems for high quality fruit. And what is worse than finding a worm in your apple? It's finding half a worm. What's the problem? It's 100% protein, it's apple flavored, and it's organic. But again, there's just something that people, they have no problems eating snails, but they have a problem with fruit, uh, with rooms, worms in them. So again, we talked about insects and disease management. Where do we start? It's with cultural management. We talk about sanitation getting rid of dead, damaged, and diseased foliage and fruit. And you must maintain a regular spray program. No, 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 Parker. I'm going to grow my trees without spraying them. And I say, that's fine. Not spraying your fruit trees is what I call neglect. And you'll get basically what, uh, probably what, you're, um, what you're, you're going for. Again, I've got a couple of kids, and, you know, I didn't want to train them when they were young. You know, I could hurt their, their psyche, their self-image. They may grow up to work at a university or a postal carrier. Is that what we want to do with our, with our kids? Of course not. We need to start from their very young to train and prune and control insects and diseases. So must maintain a regular spray program. No, 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 Parker, I want to grow organic. Okay, that's fine. But understand what organic is. Organic means sprayed with materials that are natural. Well, they're natural, so I can spray with my shorts and my Birkenstocks on? No, they're pesticides and they have to be handled as such. 
realizing I work with, again, I really don't care if you want to grow them organically or conventional. It doesn't matter. I work with growers of both. But realizing that organic fruit will be sprayed probably 40% more than our fruit that's grown conventionally. So again, you must maintain a regular spray program. Identify the pest and apply the appropriate control. Don't just be spraying your trees just for the fun of it. Most of our commercial growers don't enjoy throwing thousands of dollars and spraying them. We're spraying for specific pests uh, at specific times of the year. We can look at disease-resistant cultivars, that's fine. But if you've got a cultivar out there that may be disease-resistant, which I somewhat uh, question, there's not going to be any insect resistance, so you'll still have to spray the tree. And realizing when they're resistant to diseases, there's only several diseases that they're resistant to. They're not resistant to all. Most of the disease-resistant cultivars are not going to be that great of an issue in the southeast. We have other rats that will be much, much more of, a, of an issue. And at the bottom here, I have a link to a disease and insect management in the home orchard. That's for North Carolina. I would encourage you to look at your, your home state uh, for issues about that. So again, what do you prefer? Uh, again, this is a commercial air blast going through an orchard. We can stop upper left. We've got Tufted to ethyl bud moth, we've got bitter rot, the atom of the bottom left. Well, that's Granny Smith, believe it or not, covered with sooty blotch. And if you take a bite of that apple, guess what that would do to you? Oh, all those, those fungi, you took a bite out of it. Can you imagine what that would do to you? We're dealing with viruses now here, came from bats. So if you took a bite out of that apple, nothing would happen. It would probably maybe leave a, a slight bitter aftertaste. <clears throat> but again, the insects and diseases on fruit are not an issue for people. So again, we get other worms here. Um, I won't talk about these peach issues, but there are issues there. So what would you prefer? Having spray like that or prefer fruit like this? People said that they would be willing to buy somewhat less than ideal fruit in the grocery store, and we know that has not panned out. However, if you're growing your own fruit, maybe you will tolerate some of this. Oh my word, can you imagine an apple like this covered with all this white, white material? That's definitely covered gonna kill you, isn't it? Well, actually, no, that's one of the major organic products. It's called Surround. It's a clay. It messes up with the insect's exoskeleton in development. So again, this is a product that can be used. It'll reduce insect populations. Uh, the chewing cripper, Lepidopterus, the chewing critters, it'll reduce populations by 50%. However, I don't think 50% is going to be tolerable if I'm growing fruit trees. So again, I think something that goes along with this need to be used. Oh, I forgot, when I show you this picture, I forgot to tell you, this is the largest organic apple grower in the Southeast. I just slipped my mind, I guess. Realizing what he's wearing, he's wearing a pith helmet, he's wearing organic cartridges on his respirator, he's got gloves, he's got a Tyvek suit, he's got boots on. So again, we need to understand, are you gonna control insects or diseases? If not, maybe figs is something for you. So again, I will talk briefly about some things, and I'll conclude here to allow uh, times for questions. But fire blight is going to be a major challenge on apples and pears. Fire blight will be controlled. Usually during bloom is the only time we control it. We can use streptomycin, uh, agarist strep, when the trees are in bloom. Uh, the antibiotics do not go into the tree for the most part. We're trying to reduce the populations of the bacterium uh, before they're at a point where uh, they'll infect the tree. So it's a numbers game. Cedar apple rust is another issue that we have on apples many times. Uh, pears as well. Cedar trees, if you see uh, cedar trees with these nice, uh, basically mahogany colored, uh, basically pine cones, again, when this gets wet in the spring of the year, it turns yellow. It's got these appendages that release spores uh, that affect uh, leaves uh, from adjacent apple trees. Cedar apple rust, cedar and apple required for both life cycles. This would be a major issue for something like Golden Delicious or Golden Delicious type. But again, we look at uh, apples and diseases of pears. This was uh, from one of my uh, former colleagues, Dr. Turner Sutton. He was a retired plant pathologist. Uh, the ones with an asterisk are a problem on pears as well. But apple scab is a major issue that we have to deal with. Cedar apple rust, powdery mildew, and fire blight will be a problem for both apples and pears. The sooty blotch and five speck will be a problem on apples. And I showed you that uh, Granny Smith that was black. And then we have rots. If we, had, if we could get us a disease-resistant apple cultivar that was resistant to bitter botrysphyria or black rot, we would be golden. But we don't have any apples that are resistant to the rots that we have here. And then the uh, last one here, Fabria leaf spot, is a major issue on pears. If you see speckled leaves and speckled fruit, uh, possibly defoliation, that's going to be Fabria leaf spot. 
on, on pears. And then we'll talk about primary insects. Uh, plum curculio, as we talked about early on, causing the apples to drop. Codling moth, the apple worm, if you will. That's one we have to be concerned about. San Jose scale is a major issue on fruit trees. That's what we use dormant oil for. It's a dormant oil smothers the critter, so if we use that during the dormant season, it works well. Apple maggot is another one of those uh, apple worms. Uh, has not been an issue in many areas of the southeast, but it's increasing. Tufted apple bud moth is one of the pictures showing underneath the leaf. We have mites, European red mite. Rosy apple aphids cause the tips to turn, basically, of the apple. Uh, leaf rollers and dogwood borers on the trunk. So again, there are many different apple insects that we can that we have to deal with. And so again, it's important to understand what some of your issues will be uh, in trying to control them. So again, I will uh, stop with this slide here, but talk about managing insects uh, pests. As we talked about cultural management, where it starts. Spraying is not what we look at. And again, I put this in here, I won't go through it specifically, but we talked about cultural management and this is what our commercial growers do. On the right-hand side, we do an awful lot of monitoring and modeling. Uh, the apple, this red apple here, we try to find apple maggots when they get stuck there. We need to know we need to spray for them. Oriental fruit moth and codling moth in these tents. You'll see that little uh, thing in the center there. That's a sex pheromone that attracts insects. So we know when populations are such. And then the bottom here, this is what we call mating disruption. This is we come in and we flood the orchard with uh, basically sex pheromones, so that the males and females can't find each other, primarily with codling moth and oriental fruit moth. By doing so, if we can uh, prevent that, the mating there, we can reduce populations, and hopefully we can eliminate uh, some of our sprays. And it's been very well. Only problem is this will not be suitable for a home setting because we need about a five acre block in order to make this effective. And then the last thing over here, we are doing a lot of NEWA, we are doing a lot of monitoring of the environment, trying to find out when insects and diseases are going to be an issue and only spray at that point in time. So I will, I will conclude with that. I think my time's getting done near the end. Uh, I've got a few other slides that you can look at uh, at the end of this presentation that will be posted. Uh, like I said, uh, you can go and look at my website. Uh, I've got, got the web address at the, uh, the title slide. However, you just go to a search engine, type in Mike Parker, uh, NCSU, It'll pull you up to my website, then hit on comprehensive resources. And you'll have uh, access to all the videos that we talked about. There's also a publication, Small Scale Orchard Management, that will cover many of the things that we've talked about today as well. So with that, I will conclude. I do appreciate your time. Uh, hopefully, I've been able to provide uh, some of the information about growing apples and pears. And I wish you success in your endeavors. With that, Ashley, I'd be glad to answer any questions if there's any. Fabulous, thank you, Dr. Parker. Uh, we do have some questions. Um, one would be, it's, it's fairly interesting. Uh, the question was, would a Liberty Apple top worked with heirloom scions impart any additional disease resistance? Uh, question is, if we, have a, if we buy a Liberty Apple tree, the Liberty's been grafted onto another rootstock of some type, and then we graft varieties on top, would there be any uh, disease uh, tolerance imparted into the, vari uh, the varieties on top, for the most part, no. And if you look at Liberty, if what we're after, many times, uh, if we're going to plant Liberty, it's usually going to be for the scab resistance. As we talked about, I'm not too concerned about scab resistance uh, for many of our varieties that we plant. The other issue is Liberty, if we look at the disease resistance, I didn't go into much uh, detail there, but the disease resistant cultivars under research that we've had in North Carolina is that they drop prematurely. So the fruit don't wait until they're ripe to drop, and the quality is somewhat less than ideal. But no, using again, it's it's a good, you know, it's a good, I guess, approach or hypothesis that maybe the liberty would impart disease resistance to sign. I have seen nothing in the literature that would indicate that it imparts uh, would impart those those characteristics or traits. Thank you. Another question, we, we had several pruning questions and, and they go from planting and first year training all the way up to, I have a 30 year old tree, help me. Um, would you mind, and I know this could be quite a long discussion, but maybe just walk us through the first three years, you know, train, training a young apple or pear, and then um, maybe point us to some, some good pruning resources for, for reading up later. Okay. Um 
pruning is one of those things that is always difficult. I would encourage you to attend a pruning workshop wherever you're at. If you don't have one planned in that area, talk to your county agent. Uh, because there's a great publication written on training and pruning fruit trees you can find at my webpage. Uh, <laughs> however, once you read that and you go out and look at your trees, uh, you know, I've got pictures and I explain that. You look at your fruit trees, where do I start? It's most people are so concerned about killing their tree. Um, basically spare the spare the uh, pruners spoil the tree that's a modification i've stole that uh, some of you may recognize that so again trees do need to be pruned and they should be pruned every year uh, so again it's there's again if we're pruning it really depends on what we're pruning for but again look at the publication i also have some uh, videos on pruning uh, apple trees but let me i guess the 500 dollar message is I'll put this slide up here. How many of you feel comfortable pruning a fruit tree? And I say that to a group, you've got what, 200 people, 250 people, people here. I have a feeling if I ask this question, I may get four or five hands that go up. And then I put a pair of pruners in their hand and ask them to prune a fruit tree for me. They somewhat shy away from it. Because as a kid growing up in Michigan, my dad and I, we would go to pruning demonstrations put out by Michigan State University. And we would go home and look at our trees and we, we would come back totally confused. But again, this is a $500 message. How many of you feel comfortable pruning a fruit tree? And I guess if we look at where are the fruit born? On an apple tree, where are the fruit born? And we'll talk about peaches here, uh, just because it was here. Where are they born? Because uh, we'll compare apples and peaches. You can't prune them the same. I can teach an apple grower to grow a peach tree. I have a very hard time teaching a peach grower to grow an apple tree because it's where the fruit are born. On apple trees, the fruit are born on the tips of shoots. You can look at this, the bottom left hand, this is a golden delicious. You can see where it blossomed in the spring of the year, then that shoot grew out. However, what happens if you came in and you cut the tip of that, branches off, that branch off? You've just put the fruit on the ground. So again, many people they'll go out and they'll prune their trees, apple trees, pear trees, they prune them by tipping back the branches. And that's not the way to prune a, an apple or a pear tree. Again, you either take out the branch completely or leave it. Peaches, on the other hand, we look at all the blossoms that are formed on the laterals. So we will prune a peach tree many times by pruning the tips so that we can reduce our thinning costs. And Dave, Dave Lockwood will probably address that. So again, with apple trees, Usually when I buy a apple or pear tree, how low do I want my branches? My, my fruit trees, I want my branches usually starting about 28 inches. So when I take that tree, I will bring it back home. I'll take it in the field. I'll cut the tree off. I want branches at 28. So I'll cut that tree off at about 32, 32 inches. I'll head the top of that tree off. Realizing that will encourage branching beneath it, where I make that cup, I will get basically three or four upright shoots. And that's where I'll come in during the, the growing season, and I'll eliminate all those shoots except one to maintain my central leader. And then those side branches coming out, I use clothespins to get wide crotch angles. So again, hopefully I've, I've got publications to address that training and pruning fruit trees in North Carolina on my website, goes through and talks about that and has some of those pictures. Um, there's also a video on what do you do about large size, you know, the, the full size apple trees that have been somewhat neglected? Um, do you walk away from them? No, no. Do you cut them back and have a central leader tree that I would on a young tree? No, that's not gonna work either. But what I will do is I will try to get more of a conical shape. If I've got a full size apple tree like that, I will start pruning it at the top of the tree. Because if you've got a, a round globular tree, that's not going to allow light penetration. So I'll come in and prune that tree back trying to cut branches at the top, shorter than those at the bottom, getting good light penetration. And again, on the video there, uh, all, all that gardener at the end, it's pruning a neglected apple tree. You can look at that and we work that tree over. So again, what I would encourage when you prune trees like that, take off no more than a third of the year, or third a year, because you can do it all in one year, but the regrowth will be such rank that you won't be able to maintain it. So again, that's one of those things you usually with a, a, a full-size uh, apple tree that's overgrown. I would come in and probably take out a third of the tree, making maybe only five or six major cuts to get light penetration, air movement through that tree. 
Thank you. I especially liked how you mentioned uh, attending a, a pruning workshop. Nothing sheds light on a complicated subject like pruning, like getting out there and learning with an expert. And there are lots of those opportunities around. Um, check with your local extension offices and see what available opportunities might be out there for you. But that's great advice. And videos too, you know, being able to see it is very helpful. Um, without getting too deep into the pruning uh, rabbit hole here, uh, we did have someone inquire regarding timing for summer pruning. Any tips there? A good question. Summer pruning, you know, some people have always said, if it's not dormant, you don't prune. We do an awful lot of summer pruning. And it really depends what we're going after. When I'm training young trees in the first five to six years, I will summer prune. Usually, I would summer prune using my fingers. And I will try to do that. Uh, I do it by growth, growth stage. I would, if I'm young trees that I'm training, I usually will do my first pruning when growth is eight to 10 inches long. If I'm dealing with other trees where I need to have light penetration in the side of the tree, um, that will probably be when growth is another 18 inches or growth is 18 inches long. Most of the summer pruning that I do, I like to use my hands. I come in with a pair of leather gloves, uh, grab the growth and pull it to the side. I'm not up and down the branch, but to the side so I don't strip the bark. And realizing summer pruning should only be used to take out green growth. You shouldn't be needing to use uh, basically taking out brown wood, if you will, or older wood. There's really not any benefit for that and a benefit for that. And summer pruning, the tree should never, should never look like it does at the end of summer pruning as it does when you get done with dormant pruning. I love pruning. I really do. I hate to say that, but I love pruning and you can get carried away sometimes. We have to look at what is the goal of your summer pruning. Uh, so again, I, I would try to minimize how much I do. It's usually for light penetration uh, and encouraging uh, maybe fruit development. We usually want to stay at least away from 30 days of fruit harvest because when you're taking leaves off the tree, those leaves are producing food for the tree and you could impact fruit size. Thank you. We also had several questions regarding um, not having fruit set, blossom drops, fruit drops, just it not working out the way we would like it to regarding uh, <laughs> flowering and fruiting. Any, any suggestions on, on why there aren't any blooms one year and there are the next? Good question. Real good question. Uh, there's a couple things that we can talk about. We can talk about tree age. Someone had asked about precocity early on. Uh, and again, the trees have to be uh, mature. And the definition of mature has the ability to bear fruit. So again, if, if a tree's not having fruit and it doesn't have flowers, it's a good idea that there's probably a, mature, a maturity issue. The trees are not mature enough. So again, that's understanding that there's flowers developed. However, if flowers develop and they don't set, uh, th there's a couple things that we have to ask about. We ask about frost or freeze damage. Uh, many times I will go out and look at those uh, flowers that are falling off. I was squeezed through the, the, the enlarged portion, looking at the centers there uh, where the embryos are to see if we've cold damage, if they're brown or black, where uh, cold damage has been an issue. And the question came back about having fruit one year and not the next. It's what we call biennial bearing. If you have golden delicious apple trees, uh, you may experience uh, basically biennial bearing as a heavy crop one year and a light crop the next. Pecans do the same type of thing. Uh, with pecans, uh, we're sorry, <laughs> not a whole lot we can do about that. With apples, if we thin the crop, we know that uh, for most part, apples and pears, we don't need a, all those flowers. On apples, you can look at the picture up here in the left, uh, upper left, you can see when a flower blossom forms at the tips of shoots, there's going to be five or six flowers there at that one point. We only want one flower there. So we need to take off those other ones that surround it, what we call a lateral bloom. And if we can do that early on, there's a good chance we can sort of break this biennial bearing cycle with a heavy crop one year and a light crop the next. Another thing folks uh, struggle with in backyard situations are um, bloom sprays. You know, you mentioned, yeah. you mentioned fire blight and that, and that's an issue. And it seems the deeper South you go, the harder the fight and resistant cultivars are certainly uh, one way to wage that fight in the backyard. But can you speak to um, pollinator safety? Obviously we don't want to be spraying those plants during midday 
when when pollinators are working those flowers that if you have a fire blight situation something does need to be done any tips on pollinator safety in getting um, fire blight sprays out safely very good question uh we don't you know when weather comes in for fire blight we have to spray before rain comes in so again during bloom i do not spray anything on the tree that will be toxic to my pollinators uh, most of the time spraying at night is not an issue, uh, you know, it's not, it's a good time to spray because there will not be pollinators out there. Fire or uh, streptomycin, I have not seen any literature that indicates that it does impact pollinators. But again, I will not be spraying any insecticides on the tree when they're bloom or when I'm spraying insecticides when there's things underneath that tree that are blooming. Realizing the bees will be foraging the trees as well as blooming vegetation underneath your trees. If you're spraying any type of insecticide that will hit those flowers, you're endangering the bee population. And like I said, there's no, nothing that we should be doing to basically, ch uh, to I guess, uh, to cause our bees uh, harm or, or death. Thank you very much for clarifying that. Um, just a few more questions. I know folks, their lunch breaks are probably uh, getting close to being uh, over here, but just a couple more questions, one being, um, to mulch or not to mulch? I know you mentioned that in your presentation. Um, I think all horticulturalists have our own opinions on mulch and which ones to use, but any suggestions on um, where to get mulch if you would like to mulch and what um, substances are beneficial to root growth? One, one question was, can I use pea gravel? Um, another was, uh, what about synthetic uh, mulches? Just any wisdom to share there with what to use? If, if I'm going to be using a mulch, I'd like to use an organic mulch. Uh, I would like to be able to pull that back. If we use synthetic mulches or ground cover fabrics, we are providing a, an environment for voles to live under to damage our trees. Uh, so again, if I'm going to be using mulch, I'd like to use an organic mulch. Three to four inches is all you need around the base of the tree. Um, and I have not seen any literature that indicates any type of uh, mulch is better than other for fruit trees. It really doesn't matter. Um, the, the mulches will not uh, carry things that will uh, cause an issue for, for fruit trees. Uh, so again, uh, the, the, I'll address the, the pea gravel and or uh, permatil. Some people say you put it around the base of the tree to cause, you'll, you'll hurt the vole's feet so they won't walk over it to get to the tree. You know, if I come in and I put that around the base of the tree, we use pea gravel and permatil. It's a great uh, soil amendment for opening uh, basically pore space. If we put it around the base of the tree, we're not going to allow moisture, so we'll uh, inhibit rooting at that point in time. And even if I do prevent voles from coming in four to six inches from the tree, it doesn't matter if I have pine voles that started out basically 10 foot from the tree and they came back and they stopped at four to six inches from the tree, doesn't really matter, that tree is dead anyways. So I do not like to have any type of uh, material on the base of the tree that will inhibit rooting of that tree. So again, any mulch, I don't, really don't care. Just make sure it's no more than three to four inches, pulling it back away from the tree, uh, basically 18 inches, two foot in the fall of the year, so we can allow natural predators to get at those voles. Voles will take no prisoners. As we talked about, there's a pine vole, which basically lives underground like a mole, and there's the metal vole, which lives above ground, the field mouse. And both of those can cause damage, but different portions of the tree. Thank you. Um, last question for you. Um, one thing we didn't really discuss is um, chilling hours and cultivar selection based on how, how cold it gets and for how long. Um, since we have folks attending from all over the Southeast, we have folks, um, represented in different um, U.S. hardiness zones. Can you share some wisdom on how do I pick the right cultivars for where I live and maybe where that information can be found just based on how far spread some of our listeners are? Uh, very good question. Uh, we, again, we talk about varieties. Uh, coming from Michigan, our major varieties up there, my wife's favorite variety is Macintosh. I love Northern Spy Ida Reds. We cannot grow those in North Carolina well unless we're above 3,000 foot in elevation. Uh, if we move farther east, um, we can have some issues with, uh, with poor coloring. Again, it depends how far south we get, 
we talk about shilling and shilling requirements, and I'll let Dave Lockwood talk about that. How's that for a cop out? Because with peaches, we have a wide range of chilling requirements with different varieties, and we select varieties based upon that. With apples, we usually say around 1,200 hours of chilling has been the standard. Uh, some variety, they do have low chills. If we have people coming from basically, uh, basically South Georgia, North Florida, at that point in time, I'd probably look at some of the low chills. Uh, uh, Golden Dorset is one, Anna is another one. Uh, there is some literature that indicates that John of Gold, cross between the Jonathan and the Golden Delicious, would also be a low chill variety. So again, finding a source for information is going to be a challenge. Um, 1,200 hours of chilling is the standard that we're after. Uh, we don't get that in many areas. A lot of times we have to realize chilling is not temperatures of freezing, it's temperatures around 42 uh, that gives us optimal chilling. So again, I would maybe work with the nursery, work with your local extension uh, agent to give you an idea of what could, be, could survive in your area. Uh, it's about the best thing. That's a cop out, uh, I know, but there are many varieties that we have to be careful about uh, growing this far south. Thank you very much. Um, I know that there are other questions that we would risk running all day long. So I am going to echo what Dr. Parker just said. I encourage you to um, hit the computer and, and look up your local contact. You know, we have offices in every county in uh, the state of Georgia and each state has its own version of, a, of an extension service. So um, don't be afraid to reach out, we're here to help you. And I think that local contact would be the best person to let you know um, what you should or shouldn't plant in that backyard cultivar wise. But, Thank you so much, Dr. Parker. This has been great. We appreciate you joining us for the fifth uh, series in our, our backyard webinar. And please tune in this Friday for our session on peaches and plums.